Hey everybody, Mr. Fantini here, welcome back. Uh, this is our second video in our three video series on the three branches of the US government and the constitution. Now at the start of our last video on the legislative branch, we outlined why the government is split into three branches, about how the framers of the constitution, the guys who wrote the constitution were afraid of a tyrannical king. And so they took that power rather than concentrating it in one person who could abuse it, they split it up into three branches that all kind of have to work together in order to make the government function. So last time we talked about the legislative branch who writes the laws. Today we're going to be talking about the executive branch who enforces the laws. And next time we'll be talking about the judicial branch who interprets the laws and runs our national courts. So today let's jump in to the executive branch. So in the Constitution, in Article 2, it outlines that the executive power of the United States is vested in a president of the United States of America. As you probably know, the presidential election comes every four years and presidents have a limit of two terms. So as a maximum, a president can serve for eight years in office, though that wasn't always the case. And we actually had one president in the first half of the 20th century who served four terms, or at least was elected four times. He died in the fourth term, but uh, we'll worry about that a little bit later. Uh, so if you want to apply for the job, if you want to be president, you have to be a natural born citizen of the United States, meaning that you are a citizen from birth. Uh, this is the only office in the Constitution that requires that. You have to be at least 35 years old, and you have to have been living in the United States for 14 years. So the president is obviously the most visible figure of the U.S. government. Uh, a lot of people call the president the leader of the free world, maybe be the most powerful single person in the entire world, at least you know in our current day context. Uh, but what does the president actually do? We know that the framers of the Constitution did not want a leader with unlimited power. And even though the president might seem incredibly powerful and you know, for all intents and purposes they are, uh, there are some definite limits to what the president can do. So we're gonna break these pres presidential powers down into two categories. The first one being the chief executor of the law. We talked about how the executive branch, its role is to enforce the law. The president in that sense is sort of the chief law enforcement officer of the country in a way. Um, let's break this type of power down into a couple distinct roles that the president holds. Uh, the president is commander in chief of the U.S. military, meaning that ultimately the president is in charge of military operations of the United States. Uh, if you read the Constitution, it stipulates that the president requires a declaration of war from Congress in order to wage war. Um, this is sort of designed as a check or balance that, you know, the president can't use military force unilaterally. However, this isn't really the case anymore. In fact, the last time that the United States declared war was way back in the 1940s during World War II. Uh, now, if you know even a little bit about U.S. history, you know that the United States has fought in many, many wars since then, but they've kind of gotten around this by just claiming that those were military operations and not full-fledged wars. So over time, the president has basically acquired the use or the power to use the military without a, a declaration of war, which represents the executive getting stronger, which maybe a good thing might be a bad thing. I'll let you decide. Uh, another presidential power is the power of the veto. As the number one person in charge of enforcing the law, the president kind of has a say in which laws get passed and which ones don't. So when a new law is passed by Congress during a president's administration, the president gets the final word on whether it passes or it is rejected. Now, but as we talked about in our last video, even if the president uses that veto power, it's not technically the end of the line. Congress can still kind of check that power by overriding that veto in Congress with a 67% vote. But as we know, that's pretty rare. It's hard to get two thirds of congressmen to agree on anything. Uh, the president also has the power to issue pardons, which basically amounts to forgiving someone who has been convicted of a crime of the remainder of their sentence, kind of a get out of jail free card that the president is allowed to use. And this last one here is the most complex one, but really probably the most important one out of all of them, which is that the president makes appointments and nominations, which is basically hiring people for very important high level governmental positions. And we're going to kind of break these appointments down into two categories, cabinet secretaries. These are sort of the chief kind of like policy setters and departmental leaders of the, the main branches of the executive or the main uh, departments of the executive branch. We'll go over some of those later as well as federal judges and Supreme Court justices that serve for life, okay? So this is a little bit complicated. We'll come back to that in like two minutes, but just know that the president is responsible for filling a lot of the most important positions in the government, in the judicial branch, judges, and the executive branch, cabinet secretaries. Now, besides being the chief 
executor of the law, the chief enforcer of the law. The president also serves as the symbolic head of the nation, right? When they designed the constitution, they knew that we wouldn't have a king with uh, absolute power, but they kind of thought that it would be important to have someone who's kind of the face of the country and the leader of the country. Uh, this is probably most significant in, in international diplomacy, uh, where the president kind of fulfills the symbolic and ceremonial functions of the state. When something big and important is happening, it's usually the president that you expect to be there. When uh, ambassadors and foreign dignitaries come to the country, it's the president who will receive them if they're really, really important. And this manifests itself as a more concrete power in that the president is the person who signs treaties with foreign nations, whether they're trade treaties where we're agreeing to you know, exchange certain goods or, uh, you know, uh, resolving armed conflict, right? Signing peace treaties that comes to the president as well. Another power of the president as the head of state is the basically obligation to deliver an annual state of the union address. This is a very big, very important speech that the president gives once a year before Congress that sort of outlines the state of the country, how things are going and what the president's plan is for the upcoming year. Now, this last one here is not a formal power. It's not laid out in the Constitution, but it's just sort of a function of how the president impacts the rest of the branches and the rest of the policy that's being enacted by the government. So we have a presidential election every four years. It's the only nationally elected office that all the people of the country have a say in. And so as a result, it gets a lot of attention. And it's an opportunity for the candidates running for those offices to outline a set of priorities, a platform is what we call it, basically a set of goals that the president will try to complete in office and present those to the public and say, this is why you should vote for me because I'm going to do these things. All right. Even though the president is not going to have power to enact most of those policies, right? The president doesn't write the law. That goes to Congress. However, as the most visible person and the person who's receiving votes from all over the country, the president has a natural power to kind of mold policy, right? This is also helped out by the fact that usually when a president is elected into office, when the president first comes into office, they're going to bring with them a congressional majority for their party on their coattails, right? Because the president is the most visible person on the ballot and is going to draw the most people out to participate in the process and to vote, odds are when most people vote for the president, as they cast their vote for president and they click, you know, that name that they recognize at the top of the ballot, odds are most people will just run down the ballot and select all the other candidates from that party. So because the president brings out the biggest voter turnout out of any office for the election, odds are they're going to bring with them a lot of victories for their party in Congress. So most presidents start their term with a majority in Congress and the ability to pass the laws that they want to pass within reason. Now, what happens when this doesn't happen? What happens when we have a visible leader uh, as president and a Congress that doesn't want to do the things that the president wants to do? Uh, another form of like soft power that the president has is that as the visible leader, even if Congress isn't really sympathetic to the president's goals, the president can still address the people directly and tell them to, you know, call your congressman and demand that your congressman votes on this or that, or get people, you know, fired up and excited about a particular policy goal that the president wants Congress to do. Um, this is sometimes called a bully pulpit because the president kind of has access to this national platform and can talk to the public to try to you know, direct policy in one way or another, even if Congress isn't really excited about it. Now, let's uh, rewind a little bit and go back to that concept of appointments and nominations and talk about how the president kind of has the power to shape a lot of aspects of our life through the executive branch. Now, as I mentioned in my last video, I'm recording this in October of 2020. We have an election coming up in less than two weeks. And so this is current to where we are right now, but depending on when you're watching this, uh, some of these faces might be different, right? Um, but even though the faces might be different, the structure of the executive branch is just the same. And we can still use this as a way to like illustrate the powers that the president has. So as of right now, October 2020, the president is Donald Trump. Uh, that president, one of his powers when uh, the president first takes office is to appoint their cabinet. And the cabinet is sort of the name for all of these appointed officials, the secretaries, the heads of departments that uh, the president brings with them into power. So here are just a couple examples of it. Uh, one person that the president appoints is the attorney general. 
the attorney general is the person in charge of the Justice Department and deciding, you know, which crimes are investigated, which crimes are prosecuted, things like that, how we're going to allocate our resources to try to punish and prevent certain crimes. Um, another very important cabinet position is, is the Secretary of State, who's sort of like the head diplomat of the United States, head the person most responsible for cultivating international relations. We also have, uh, that person is currently Mike Pompeo, is that guy's name. Uh, underneath him, we have our Secretary of the Treasury, currently Steve Mnuchin, uh, which even though is not necessarily the most interesting because you know not everyone's all that fascinated with uh, interest rates and treasury bonds and things like that, the Secretary of the Treasury has a tremendous amount of power to set policies that are then adopted by banks in terms of setting interest rates, determining how easy it is to get a loan and, and things like that. These are just three examples. In total, there are 15 cabinet secretaries that the president appoints when uh, they first come into office. And all of these secretaries have to be approved by the Senate. This is a way that's built into the Constitution to try to ensure that the person being picked for the job is qualified for the job. Now, just to illustrate the power of each of these individual secretaries, uh, let's run down the list here. So the Attorney General, as we said, is the head of the Justice Department. As a result, the Attorney General can set law enforcement policies and decide which cr crimes to prosecute and investigate. Uh, as the Attorney General, this guy, Bill Barr, is uh, basically the boss of U.S. attorneys who charge people with crimes uh, and law enforcement organizations like the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the FBI. The Secretary of State, similarly, uh, directs relations with other countries and is sort of the head diplomat and can uh, direct the services of diplomats in other countries. Steve Mnuchin, our Treasury, Treasury Secretary there at the bottom, sets monetary policy, interest rates, buy, buying and selling bonds, uh, regulating inflation, things like that, and is sort of the head person of the IRS who collects taxes and other departments such as the United States Mint, which determines how much currency to print. Now, an important distinction here, just so that we are remembering that, you know, these sort of elected and appointed officials aren't all powerful. These departments are still constrained by the laws that are passed by Congress and are staffed by people who are not political appointees, as we call them. They're staffed by what we call bureaucrats or career people who work within these departments, whether these are like, you know, the FBI agents or the diplomats or the, you know, tax accountants and, and all these types of uh, people who aren't necessarily uh, beholden to a political party or the voters, right? They're, they're professionals. So, even though these groups, these people on the ground will largely stay the same no matter who wins a presidential election, their bosses and the priorities of their bosses are ultimately determined by who we elect as president, right? So that's just a very quick breakdown of how the president can sort of shape the policies that uh, shape our lives, essentially. Now, one thing for us to keep an eye on uh, as we move forward in our study is how the role of the presidency changes, right? The constitution doesn't change all that much. There are some amendments that have been added, but you know, the, the, the letter of the law of what the president can do kind of stays the same, but how that plays out in the real world is a little bit different. Um, and what we've seen pretty steadily over the course of the past hundred years or so is that the president has grown much more powerful over time. One reason that the president has grown so much more powerful is the proliferation of executive orders executive orders. And this is basically like a kind of a memo that the president writes out from the president's desk, signs it, and sets rules and policies to be enforced by the executive branch. This is sort of like things that apply if we go back a little bit to all these types of departments that operate under the executive branch. Now, even though it's not technically a law, it seems a lot like a law, right? If you have all these departments of government that are following certain policies, uh, it gives the president a lot of power to direct the attention and resources of the executive branch and basically uh, give them, gives him the power to set policy in a way that's almost like a law. Another thing that we mentioned a minute ago is the use of military force without a declaration of war, um, which, you know, if you look back through the 20th century American history after World War II, you know, we have the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq. All these were wars that were not declared by Congress. And so wars that did not require that check on presidential power, which is a little bit troubling, right? So one, one question that I always get when it comes to the presidency is, well, we know that if something happens to the president, then the vice president steps up. But what happens if something happens to the president and the vice president? So uh, I always try to include this here, which is a list of the presidential line of succession, uh, where 
below the vice president, we have the Speaker of the House. Below the Speaker of the House, we have the President pro tempore of the Senate, which is basically the person who's been in the Senate the longest. And then it goes into this, the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary of State, Treasury, Defense, et cetera, et cetera. And part of the reason I bring this up is for our final topic about the presidency, which is another one that I get a lot of questions about, which is impeachment, aka what if the president is a crook, in the words of Richard Nixon over here as he's getting on his uh, his helicopter there. So impeachment is something that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, it's a term that's kind of in our vocabulary, but it's very, very frequently misused or misunderstood, right? A lot of times when we think impeachment, we think, oh, that's when you throw the president out of office. But what impeachment actually is, is just an accusation of a crime against a public official. And that's important too, that impeachment, uh, other people in the government can be impeached, not just the president, but it's basically an accusation that a person has committed a crime within their office, all right? Basically an abuse of power, whether it's bribery or, or one of these types of things. If a public official is suspected of a crime, it is one of the responsibilities of the House of Representatives to conduct an investigation, gather the information, the evidence, and then ultimately vote on whether or not to impeach a person. And that requires a 50% plus one vote, a simple majority. Now, that's your impeachment, the accusation. You're not removed from office yet. After articles of impeachment are filed by the House of Representatives, the Senate is then responsible for conducting a trial for hearing witnesses, viewing evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And then the Senate is the one who votes to remove for, from office or not, or to convict uh, or not. But that requires a 67% vote within the Senate, uh, which, like we said before, is really, really hard to convince two thirds of senators on anything, right? So what is the precedent for this, right? Uh, what what experience does our country have with this process, with impeachment? Um, one thing that always kind of strikes people as surprising is that the president most associated with corruption and impeachment is often this guy up here I just mentioned, Richard Nixon, uh, for the Watergate scandal and a bunch of other abuses of power. But interestingly enough, he is not one of our three presidents who have been impeached. And how did he get away with that? Uh, kind of ties into two other powers that we talked about a minute ago. Um, after his vice president had already stepped down, Nixon appointed a new vice president, Gerald Ford. That's something that he has the power to do. Uh, and knowing that he was about to be impeached and investigated and very likely convicted for the things that he did, he chose to resign instead. He said, see you later, I'm out of here. At which point the vice president, the next person in line, stepped up, became the president, and Gerald Ford who was just appointed by Nixon, turned around and said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pardon Richard Nixon for any potential wrongdoing, which again is the power of the presidency, right? All of these things were in line with what the Constitution says a president can do. But if you're looking at it from an outside perspective, you're like, yeah, maybe that's not a great situation, right? It's kind of an abuse of those constitutional powers. So Nixon was not impeached. Our three presidents who have been impeached are these three guys right here, Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and as of about a year ago, Donald Trump as well. Right. Um, in terms of what these these guys did, the Andrew Johnson long time ago, uh, basically, he obstructed Congress's uh, Congress's policies during Reconstruction. He was a gigantic racist and a bad person. Uh, he deserved to get impeached, but we're not going to get into exactly why. Uh, interestingly enough, most of my students tend to know why Bill Clinton got impeached. Uh, well, they know sort of the scandal associated with the impeachment. But let's kind of break it down. Uh, most of them know that Bill Clinton had an affair when he was in office. Um, but remember, what is impeachment but an accusation of a crime? Now, cheating on your wife is pretty messed up, but is it a crime? No, it's not. And actually, the reason why he was impeached connects with what we covered last week in our legislative branch episode, uh, which is the power of Congress to, to conduct investigations under subpoena. So Congress summoned Clinton before Congress and asked him if he had an affair, and he said, no, I did not. And it turned out that he did. So Clinton was not impeached for having an affair, but was rather impeached for lying in front of Congress about his affair. Not a great move. Now, the Trump impeachment last year uh, is a slightly more complicated affair. Uh, he was essentially accused of using his political position to uh, try to coerce a foreign government to launch an investigation against Joe Biden's son. Um, the House conducted the investigation and filed impeachment. 
proceedings. But as we know, the House is controlled by the opposite party, by the Democrats, whereas the Senate is controlled by his own party, the Republicans. And even though, like we said a second ago, uh, or in the previous episode, ideally, you would want congressmen to take their, uh, uh, their position very seriously and look at the facts of the case. But the reality is, in all three of these impeachment proceedings, that members of the opposite party are far more likely to think that the president has done something wrong than members of the president's own party. And so just as in the three previous impeachments, uh, the vote was essentially along party lines and the Senate voted to acquit Donald Trump, uh, right? So we've had three presidents impeached. None of them have been removed from office. None of them have cleared that 67% threshold, all right? Uh, and that's the long and short of the presidency, right? I want you to bear in mind that uh, we've now covered the sort of theoretical powers of the presidency, how these powers actually play out in person tends to be a little bit different, but we're going to start with just understanding these three branches and the constitution and all that basic stuff before we get into the nitty gritty of, uh, of how events play out in reality. So that'll wrap us up for our second video here on the executive branch. Uh, join back with us next time to talk about the third and final branch, the judicial branch. All right. I'll see you then. See you later.